It's fair to say that no matter how bad the situation in your country, Venezuela is doing worse. As of 2015, they are experiencing more inflation than any other country in the entire world. Furthermore, their capital, Caracas, is currently ranked as being the world's most violent city, beating out other famously violent cities in both Mexico and Colombia. Now it's less about Something as simple as buying toilet paper has also become practically impossible in Venezuela and scarcity has become a norm in supermarkets. Other products such as condoms have to be bought and sold on the black market. And all of this is happening in a country with the world's largest oil reserves. In fact, it wasn't so long ago that Venezuela was the richest country in the whole of South America. But today, over half their population lives in poverty. So the big question is, how did they end up there? How how did the government destroy the economy in such a short amount of time? Today, we're going to tell you that story. The Bolivarian Revolution. The first character in our story is Hugo Chavez, the father of modern-day Venezuela. Or should we say the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. He became president after a landslide victory in 1999. His campaign was based on the promise of equality and poverty reduction, a policy that he called 21st century socialism. One of his first policies was called the System for the Democratization of Jobs. This was meant to be implemented in the PDVSA, the state company that extracts Venezuela's oil. And don't forget now that we're talking about a country that has bigger oil reserves than Saudi Arabia. PDVSA's payroll has more than doubled to 115,000 employees since Chavez took office in 1999, and debt has risen tenfold since 2006 to 34 billion US dollars. This was pretty big news considering the PDVSA is the largest company in South America. Nevertheless, Venezuela kept producing the same number of barrels per year. This means that the staff increase had nothing to do with corporate reasons, but rather political ones. In fact, this job democratization was a way to employ all of the unemployed Venezuelans. The same thing happened in the government. During the Chavez administration, public spending tripled. This meant more government workers and more social programs than ever before. However, none of this was a problem as long as the oil exports kept paying the bills. In fact, Chavez cut poverty in half. Despite being an oil-rich country before Chavez, 60% of the population lived in poverty. Ten years after Chavez, only 30% did. Despite Chavez's rhetoric that capitalist countries were trying to destroy the revolution, no one would reject Venezuela's oil. Even Nicolas Sarkozy, France's conservative president, of the time was complimenting Venezuela's democracy. I'm glad about Venezuelan elections, with their strong turnout that shows, once again, the vitality of democracy in Venezuela. To all of these policies, we must add the famous This literally means expropriate this, expropriation being the taking away of private property from its owner. Chavez was no fan of private businesses, and it was not uncommon for him to visit a city and go around declaring that various businesses be nationalized. Since Venezuela kept making oil and everyone was happy. But just hold on a minute, because this is where things turn sour. In 2014, oil prices fell and Venezuela was the first country to feel the effects of this fall. Their profit per barrel shrank more and more every single day. Now, by the time the oil crisis started, Hugo Chavez had already passed away and his successor was a guy named Nicolas Maduro. You whistle, I whistle. <laughs> The bird looked at me funny, then flew over my head, and I could feel the spirit of Chavez blessing. Venezuela was once the richest country in Latin America. It has the largest known oil reserves in the world, and its democratic government was once praised worldwide. But today, Venezuela's democratic institutions and its economy are in shambles. The country has the highest inflation rate in the world, making food and medicine inaccessible to most Venezuelans. Over the last four years, its GDP has fallen 35%, which is a sharper drop than the one seen during the Great Depression in the US. And the country's murder rate has surpassed that of the most dangerous cities in the world. These conditions have sparked months of protests against the president, Nicolas Maduro, and it's easy to see why. 
country has become measurably worse since his election in 2013. Maduro's political ambition became evident in December 2015. Two years after he became president, a coalition of opposition parties called the Democratic Unity Roundtable, or MUD, won a two-thirds majority in the National Assembly, putting Maduro's rule at risk. In response, Maduro quickly forced out several Supreme Court justices and filled the positions with cronies loyal to him. In March 2016, the court ruled to strip the opposition-led National Assembly of its powers, a move that sparked massive protests across the country. The ruling was reversed a few days later, but the damage was done. Protests continued to grow and have left about 100 dead and thousands injured so far. Despite the violence and public outcry, Maduro held a vote in July to elect a new governing body called the National Constituent Assembly, which would have the power to rewrite Venezuela's constitution and essentially replace the National Assembly and leave virtually no opposition to Maduro's rule. Era un fraude cantado, ya se sabía, pero con una gran participación forjada por el gobierno. Maduro's government is trying to create the illusion of public support. The government claimed about 8 million people, or 40% of the country, voted, but experts put that number much lower, at just 3 million people. Maduro found himself the head of a country that wasn't making enough money from its only export, and Maduro had wages to pay. Then, on top of all this, we have the famous... Uh, now, because of all that expropriating that was going on, we've been left with a Venezuela that has no private companies. So, even if he decided to raise taxes, there's no one left to pay them. And this is when Maduro made the most irresponsible decision that any political leader can make. He decided to print money. Having devalued the Venezuelan currency, see the Bolivar, inflation skyrocketed. Here's an example of how bad this was. Imagine you're sitting in a bar in Caracas in July of 2016. A BMI cost you around 50 bolivars. Then you go back to the same bar in Caracas in September, and that same beer would cost you 100 bolivars. This has been happening in Venezuela consistently for the last three years. Obviously, this had the effect of destroying all of the poverty reduction measures that Chavez had implemented. Oh, and believe me, it gets worse from here. Just when things were looking really terrible, Maduro decided to demonstrate just how much worse they can get. No instrumento. The new tool to finish with the price increases will be the creation of the maximum sales price. According to Maduro, the hyperinflation was caused by those evil capitalists who wanted to destroy Venezuela. So the logical solution, of course, was to fight them. So you're probably wondering right now what exactly the outcome of all of this is. Well, this time, let's imagine that you own a butcher's shop in the beautiful city of Maracaibo. You buy meat from a Colombian farmer and you pay with US dollars. For example, let's say that a pound of beef costs you $10. The Venezuelan central bank has an official exchange rate of 10 bolivars to 1 US dollar. But no one's gonna sell you dollars at that price because the market price is way higher. This means that if you want to buy beef from your Colombian producer, you're going to have to pay the price set by the market. This is the equivalent of 10,000 bolivars per $10. All right, fine, but then you go back to your shop and you want to sell this pound of beef that you've bought. But then you find out that the government has set a maximum sale price of a thousand bolivars, which is ten times less than what you paid. So now you've got two options. You can, one, close up your shop, or two, sell your meat on the black market. Now, some of you might be wondering, why do they have to buy foreign meat? Why can't they just buy meat that was made inside Venezuela? The answer is that whatever product you buy, it's going to require something that is made outside of the country that you bought the product in. For example, if you want to grow wheat, you're going to need a tractor, which is manufactured somewhere else, and you might find that even the seeds or the fertilizer are also made in a different country. One way or another, there is no country on Earth that is capable of producing all that they consume not even the United States. Oh, and don't forget now that Venezuela based their entire economy on the export of oil, and today, still, that's not going so well. Venezuelan oil has become so expensive that they'd rather buy it from external sources than even use their own oil. BDVSA has launched one of its largest oil tenders ever seeking to buy some 8 million barrels of US or Nigerian light crude for delivery from April through June. 
As I mentioned previously, Venezuelan oil is really expensive to produce, and it turns out that they'd just rather buy it from other countries than use their own oil. Meanwhile, shops cannot import goods. This is leading to a scarcity of toilet paper and has even led to situations where people have stabbed each other over a small piece of bread. So now that we've given you the rundown on Venezuela, we'd love to know what you think. Do you think Maduro will be able to pull his country out of collapse? Do you see there's an alternative for him to pursue? We'd love to know your opinion. Just let us know in the comments below. Thank you for watching Thoughts Camera Action. Before you go anywhere, don't forget to click subscribe.